This is the prime sponsor here for CA CR15. Shall we close the hearing? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Is he here? Is she here? I'm a sponsor. Would you like to introduce some of the bill for the prime sure. sponsor? And the floor is yours if you'd like to introduce yourself. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, committee. My name is Paul Birch, I'm representative from Cheshire One, which is Walpole, Westmoreland, Chesterfield, and Hinsdale. Um, I'm here to introduce to the committee and uh, speak in favor of CACR 15, which would allow taxpayer standing uh, to challenge certain governmental actions. <laughs> if I may, uh, I will try to be relatively brief. Uh, this uh, CACR would allow taxpayers eligible to vote to request a declaratory judgment as to whether the state or the appropriate political subdivision in which the taxpayer lives has spent or approved spending of public funds in a manner that would violate the Constitution, statutes, laws, or ordinances. Um, there are some limitations uh, that would keep uh, uh, litigation from happening if there are other judicial or administrative paths forward that could be taken. Um, the concept of standing, I, I trust you're familiar with. It's an ability to basically be in court and be able to litigate uh, the federal Constitution has one concept of standing, which is basically that you have to have skin in the game uh, in order to uh, be a, uh, a plaintiff in, in a uh, suit involving uh, these kind of issues. The uh, New Hampshire Constitution is different. And uh, the New Hampshire Constitution has long been interpreted, though there are two lines of, of thought throughout the years that you didn't need the kind of standing for federal uh, approach in, in New Hampshire. The New Hampshire Supreme Court in, in a series of more recent decisions has uh, ruled uh, that yes, you do. Uh, this, uh, the purpose of this CACR is to return uh, the status of that in New Hampshire back to what it was. Basically, it increases governmental accountability. Uh, we're talking about the spending of taxpayer money. We're talking about spending public funds. Uh, and uh, this uh, would allow basically more governmental accountability. I started off a couple years ago, because this has come up before, opposed to this. I was worried, frankly, that uh, collateral consequences like harassing lawsuits uh, uh, and the like um, on balance would be more of a problem than a benefit. I was approached uh, actually by uh, Chuck Douglas and some others and asked if I would bring my concerns to a, uh, a bipartisan and uh, legislative and non-legislative group to see if we could work out some kind of language that would uh, make things work in my mind as well as is in others. This was a cooperative based uh, effort. It's bipartisan. It's been years in the making. It went through House Judiciary unanimously. It went through the House I think 309 to 9. Uh, it's like all compromises, and, and you all are familiar with compromises, that there's a bit of a uh, deck of cards aspect to compromises that you don't want to start pulling things in and out, or the reasons why some people compromise will no longer be the reason that some people compromise. But uh, I'm pleased to say that the language that, that we uh, 
we decided on um, has uh, has borne fruit so far. Thank you for your testimony for stepping up to the plate to introduce Bill. I, I, a quick question: Did you hear examples as to the need for this? I, I, I know there was some Supreme Court decisions, but you must have heard the testimony uh, as to why we need this. The there's two. There's the generic need that we have heard and I have heard as, as just as a representative of people who've come to me and said, I've, I've got some questions about whether my town is, is spending public money in an appropriate way and I think I should have a right to go to court and, and have a judge say whether it was spent in the right way or not. The classic recent example is educational funding. Um, as a matter of public policy, um, New Hampshire is spending um, funds or being a pass-through for funds. I don't want to get into the debate on vouchers and what's a voucher and what's not, but that issue is out there as to whether that is in fact violative of the New Hampshire Constitution or not. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, the, we have what's called the Blaine Amendment and how much uh, effect the Blaine Amendment should be given in 2018 is an open question. But we need to have that question answered. And in the Duncan case, it was that we were unable to get an answer to that question. The answer could go this way, the answer could go that way, but it's better governance if we can get answers to questions like that, which are fairly fundamental to our job as well as the taxpayers want to know the answer to that question. And if the answer is it's fine, then things will proceed along a certain track. If the answer is it's not fine, things will proceed along a different track. That's, but getting an answer is generally a good thing. That was very good, thank you. Uh, Senator Dennis. Yes, Senator. Do, do you know what caused this change from having standing to not having standing? Is there a particular bill that <coughs> This came up, I believe, as a statutory change in the past. I don't have the bill number um, because of, an, uh, of a situation uh, pre-Duncan. There was another Supreme Court decision before Duncan by a couple of years, which indicated pretty strongly that uh, the New Hampshire Supreme Court would take a narrow view of standing. Then, in response to that, a statute was passed by the legislature, and that statute, I believe, was used as a basis for the Duncan case. And the Supreme Court in the Duncan case said, statute's not good enough because standing, resolving the standing question is a constitutional question, not subject to statutory uh, reform or, or change. That's why this is brought in, in the form of the CAC lab. Any further questions? Thank you for stepping up to the plate. Thank you. Uh, has the Prime Sponsor stepped into the room? So we're talking a couple of times and shut the scene. Okay. Very grateful for your testimony, Representative. Uh, <clears throat> Representative Park, you haven't indicated whether you want to speak or not. I don't know Mr. Tibu. I have some, I have the, uh, prepared remarks, so can I hand those out? Yes, you yes. can. I have extra copies.
Four years. Before I start, is there a reason why there's a safe back there? Is it's that a, a pill? It, it's basically to let you know that you're safe. <laughs> I was told there's gold in there. I didn't see any gold. Uh, maybe Harald was in there, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. That doesn't look Okay. okay. Four years. <laughs> My name is Fred Thiebaum, and I was, represent the National Taxpayers Association. I'm from Nashville. 25 years ago, we brought, we, the National Taxpayers, brought suit against the city because our taxpayers group was barred from meeting in City Hall to plan a referendum petition for a spending cap of local government. We prevailed. And any citizen group can meet today in City Hall. We elected the spending cap in the City of Nashville over 24 years ago, which is now coded into our city charter. Last year, I brought a petition to Superior Court, Hillsborough County South, to stop city government from manipulating the city's annual budget for the purpose to evade the spending cap. What I had expected to be a brief two-hour hearing traditionally granted for a writ of mandamus petition for correcting the hearing about wrongful government conduct turned into a series of hearings culminating in a six-hour hearing in October six months after we brought this rid of mandamus. Following the final hearing, and a number of things prior, we received a court order asking us to address our standing. And just after hearing it's done, now we have to address our standing. And the court quoted Duncan versus New Hampshire. I'm sure that it's going to be mentioned here today. It's 166 New Hampshire 62. Soon thereafter, our case was dismissed. Although we had calculated the precise dollar value of our personal injury, the judge stated in his decision, citing Duncan, that he did not believe that we had articulated a personal injury indistinguishable from the injuries suffered by all taxpayers in the city. We are now appealing this decision to the New Hampshire Supreme Court. But this is why we need CARC 15. We need to be able, as taxpayers, to bring a grievance to court. The local government violates the law and engages in wrongful conduct that affects all taxpayers <coughs> in the community. A taxpayer should not have to see his petition dismissed for lack of standing, like we were, because his personal injury, even though we feel it was distinguished, the court felt could not be distinguished from the injury suffered by other taxpayers. We need to uphold the New Hampshire tradition of being able to hold our state and local government accountable for wrongful conduct especially where this involves the unlawful budgeting and our expenditure of public funds. This is why we brought our case. This legislation passed the House Judiciary Committee by a unanimous vote of 18 to 0. And it passed the House by a vote of 309 to 9. It should pass this committee. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, is there any questions you can? I don't have any questions. Well done. Thank you. Ed Nally? Nail? How do I sound that? Ed Nail, like a hammer and nail. Uh, chairman of the Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. <laughs> Uh, in favor of the, this uh, process to restore the rights of uh, taxpayers to uh, be involved in local government. If they don't have a right to challenge their local government, 
why bother going? I mean, we have, you asked for an example. Um, I can give you, our taxpayer group has lots of them, where we've had one example. Last year, uh, the Hillsborough Deering School District had a proposal for their, uh, they were gonna put a warrant article in their, on their budget for um, $984,000 to buy four portable units and put them together and make one million dollar school. The portable units were to be leased. You're not allowed to lease land or lease buildings under our statutes. They thought they'd get away with leasing four, put them together into one. Once that's established, then come ask for the money for the electric and for the sewer and the rest of it. So what they were doing was in violation, it's, uh, it's uh, basically a situation with taxation that the, the uh, the mobile units are considered real estate, and you can't get the lease on real estate. Like I said, I went to the DRA, and they were, first they were not convinced, well, until we went through the statutes one by one. And they, yeah, we can't, we can't allow the town to do this. They leased an uh, oil burner and some other things year, year before, which is fine, it has a lifespan. But I threatened to, I, I went to a couple of their meetings and said, you understand that you're putting four leased portable units together and then calling them one one building. They didn't want to go for a bond. The simple fact that they could avoid a bond by going through at least buildings was, was their goal. I said, if you attempt to do that, I'll take you to court. And I will draft my case and give it to you 30 days before I file it and give you a chance, your attorneys a chance to look at it before we go to court. Our taxpayers group's been doing this since the 90s. You know, drafting a case in Superior Court on behalf of taxpayers in the town trying to find somebody brave enough to put their name on it and presenting it to, to them and giving them 30 days to comply and read through the statutes and understand what they're doing before we go see a judge. So, and that has prevented in town after town all kinds of crazy spending and, uh, and <coughs> discord. We have 235 little towns and I don't know how many schools where the people that run it kind of fly by the seat of their pants some years and, and put proposals together like this. Without an opportunity for a taxpayer, an individual taxpayer, one, basically representing everybody else, to come forward and say, yeah, this, has to, this is not legal. You know, I don't, want this on, I don't want this on the ballot. I don't even want to vote it in because it would cause more consultation. Once it's voted in, then people would challenge it again and we go on. So uh, another issue in that same town, we had uh, the portable units they were removing were uh, assessed for uh, like $200,000 a piece. We couldn't sell them for a dollar. They were towed out. But the assessment for those portable, useless portable units was so high it allowed the, the school to borrow against the value. That could have been litigated. So there's, there's dozens of little issues in there that violate taxpayers' rights. They're just not sensible. And without somebody in a town, one or two brave people saying, yeah, we'll come forward and, as taxpayers and do this, um, it just it's, it's caused nothing but harm if you take away the right of a citizen to challenge is the way is taxed, and as we still have board of tax and land appeals, you can go challenge your assessment. You know that that's still there, but the way they do business, and we find in town after town and schools, there's certain individuals that drag us back into court over and over again. So this is I, the one problem I see with this is I would like to see it amended so that when a taxpayer brings a case, that the filing fee is waived. In the town of uh, Wil uh, Windsor one of our most famous cases, we had to go to court like, three times on the right to know before we discovered that the, uh, the selectmen had let 22 friends and relatives not pay property taxes for 10 years. Four individuals in that town spent months rebuilding the town's records from the ground up. We got, we went in and photocopied everything, took a machine in and photocopied everything. Four people rebuilt Windsor's records. We had no help from the DRA. The state police came and took the records from the town, disappeared. We never heard any resolution of that. No court, no one helped us. It was individuals in the town, and the, the reason they were, they were empowered was because they had the right to go to court for 91A, and they had the right to represent themselves in, in this situation. So I would highly recommend that we restore the rights of citizens to challenge in court, the Superior Court, the, um, or anywhere, or the state, with taxation and uh, represent the other people in the town. That's the way our system's made. It's a way of what? That's where our system was. No, it's, was, a way of, no, it's made. No. You said to amend it to waive? To uh, amend it to waive the $250 filing fee. 
Otherwise, it's 250, 250, over and over again. You know, for we want a right to know case for uh, the ability to bring cameras into their town meeting. We want that. We want another one for documents. It just goes on and on, and it's and there's no punishment for for public officials that repeatedly do this, but there is a financial burden on the individual. Said, okay, I'll I'll step up to the plate. So these with. Polish names for taxpayers, we don't bring vexatious cases. You know, we try to resolve them by letting the town know, the DRA know, anybody else involved, and, and the, uh, the town's attorneys also copy them and say, before we have to go see a judge, why don't we all put our cards on the table? And it works. So restore this right we've always had, and uh, a little cherry on top would be to, uh, to waive the uh, fees, or uh, the court fees, because they do this out of their pocket. Uh, if you want to see other examples, I have hand truck loads at the office in Cocker. You can come down, I'll show you how they work. Questions from the committee? Uh, yes. Question on, on waiving the filing fee. Uh, would we, could we ever reach a situation where somebody just continues to file frivolous suits? Yeah, that has happened uh, in uh, Laconia area, Meredith up there. So there was an individual that was bringing cases, and the court said, okay, you're just bringing cases for the sake of bringing cases, and he had to pay court costs. A judge has an opportunity in any of these cases to say your your uh, case was frivolous and you're going to pay the costs of the town. It's rare. It happens. I'd like to see it happen more often. If we have an individual that's suing just for the sake of suing, man, we won't talk to him. Have a judge fix it right there. That judge has the opportunity to do that, and um, but I don't think judges have the right to change our right to uh, a redress in court, which we always have. Thank you very much. And, uh, Next we'll have uh, Bissonette in the ACLU. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I also have... Uh, one second, real quick. I'm just going to check where judiciary is. I'm waiting to testify there too. So. Oh, do you, uh, do you? I can see. I'll see my time to Mr. Zibble. Do you Zibble. want to testify right now? That would uh, be great. I have eleven thirty. Very short. Would it be possible to testify right after? Yes, Mr. Zibble. Okay, thank you. I'm just kind of long in the audience. Here, so. Don't go far. I won't. Thank you. <laughs> very short testimony. Yeah. Good morning, members of the committee. Uh, Howard Zibble, a legislative liaison for the judicial branch. Uh, and we're not taking a position uh, saying against it, but at least wanted to make sure the committee is aware of uh, two areas of concern regarding the impact uh, of a taxpayer stamp. One, um, <clears throat> obviously, is the potential for increasing numbers of cases, largely in the Superior Court. Uh, potentially in the Supreme Court. Uh, should not affect the Circuit Court, uh, but the Superior and the Supreme Court. And the issue there is just resources. Um, <coughs> the, for example, the statute uh, authorizes 22 judges in the Superior Court, uh, but we haven't been there in over a decade. Uh, during the really bad economic times, um, about 10 years ago, um, the resources were capped at 18 judges. Uh, Senator Daniels, from his finance experience, is well aware we've been coming and uh, requested to get back to 22, but uh, we're so far at 21. So resources uh, is an issue um, to open up the, um, judi the courts to uh, suits by any taxpayer. The other is a little bit more uh, subtle issue, and it's one you're, you're probably surprised to hear me raise. Um, it, it is that a taxpayer standing constitutional amendment could broaden the power of the judicial branch. Um, it, it sort of sets it up as a super legislator or a super executive, because as taxpayers come who may not have the traditional legal standing, um, they can be challenging actions of local, you know, local bodies and, and legislative enactments that they don't have normal standing to do. And then the courts become a super legislator uh, and, and a super uh, executive. I mean, taxpayer standing means unlimited and basically unbridled judicial review 
of legislative and executive action, uh, both state and local, uh, in the suit of any taxpayer and uh, on the suit of any taxpayer. Uh, I'm just going to conclude uh, with a quote from a retired lawyer, now retired, uh, Gene Van Loan, uh, who wrote an article in the New Hampshire Bar News, a publication for lawyers, after the Duncan uh, case. And his article was entitled, The Unappreciated Virtues of Judicial Humility. He concluded as follows, but besides being right, referring to the fact that the court, in his view, was right in Duncan, the justices also exhibit a trait which is in short supply these days, judicial humility. <coughs> Despite having been offered the opportunity by the legislature to assume general superintendence over the whole of state government, uh, the court exercised self-restraint and <coughs> turned down the offer. Bravo. And of course, uh, CACR 15 would reinstate uh, the offer to give the board general superintendents over everything, basically. Because taxpayers could bring, bring a suit on anything that upset them. Thanks. Questions? All set. Thank you. And thank you for taking me out of order. And now we'll hear from uh, oh, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I have a written testimony as well that I've circulated. Uh, my name is Gilles Bissonnette. I'm the legal, legal director for the American Civil Liberties Union of New Hampshire. Uh, we uh, strongly support CACR 15, and I think I'll just open my remarks just by addressing some of the things that Attorney Zibble uh, referenced moments ago. Um, I did, it's, it's unusual, I think, in fact, for the judiciary to be testifying on policy matters. It seems like that's what it's doing here, so I just want to be able to respond real briefly. Um, this is not something that's going to uh, open the floodgates. Uh, we had taxpayer standing for about 100 years um, before the Bayer decision in 2010, and then we had it when the legislature reinstituted it in 2012 up until 2015. And so during that 100-year span, uh, it did not open the floodgates to litigation in the state. Uh, I, I believe uh, Attorney Douglas, with whom I've been working on uh, on this, uh, has uh, estimates of really a handful of cases each year brought pursuant to taxpayer standing, uh, something that easily could absorb by the judiciary, and in fact was absorbed by the judiciary. Um, and uh, the judiciary hasn't pointed out when they had taxpayer standing uh, any influx of, of litigation as a result. Um, in addition, of course, the courts, uh, as was mentioned before, have the ability to cull out early frivolous lawsuits. Um, you know, in my experience litigating uh, against the government, the government has no issue from time to time uh, filing motions to dismiss, which is the, the procedural vehicle that allows cases to be uh, uh, dismissed before discovery, before a significant amount of resources has um, been used in litigating the case. Um, and I, I would disagree with Attorney Zibel that this gives courts unbridled authority. All it does is give the courts the authority that it had for a hundred years before the Duncan decision. And there are some limitations, of course, to the language of CACR 15 itself um, that that cabin its usage. You have to be a voter or eligible voter um, in the state of New Hampshire. So you can't have someone just driving through the state who goes to McDonald's and pays the meals tax, you know, and then gets the ability to sue the state. No, uh, there are, that's a, I think an important limitation that's put in here. And of course, you need to be a taxpayer of the political subdivision that you are actually suing. Another significant limitation that was put within CACR 15, and this has been really the product of multiple years of revision um, in negotiation. Um, and, and so I think those limitations are important. And of course, it is the legislature's prerogative to reverse the Supreme Court decision if it ultimately disagrees with it. Um, I know that the Eugene Van Loan article was referenced. Chuck Douglas and I actually wrote a response to that Eugene Van Loan article in the Bar News that I'd be happy 
to submit uh, to the committee articulating uh, why, why we think um, taxpayer standing is not only appropriate, but it's something that has really been consistent with how our Constitution has been interpreted for um, over a century. Because really what CACR 15 is about at the end of the day is government accountability. Government accountability on issues that span the political spectrum. Um, and I think ultimately that's why uh, this committee, uh, this bill received, or the CACR received a unanimous recommendation out of House Judiciary and passed overwhelmingly um, in the House. Um, my written testimony, I'm not going to get into the details here, explained the history of taxpayer standing. Um, but I wanted to give just one other example um, of, of how taxpayer standing could really improve government accountability. And I'll use a national example. In 2008, Congress ratified and expanded uh, the National Security, National Security Agency's warrantless wiretapping program. And this gave the NSA uh, really unchecked power, in our view, to monitor international phone calls and emails. Uh, so we knew this program exists, but because it's a secret, we didn't know specific individuals who were targeted by it. So uh, the ACLU and other groups actually went to court saying this is an unconstitutional program, we know it exists, we know there are individuals who are being harmed by this, but that case was dismissed because of lack of standing. So we know that there's a harm, we knew that taxpayer dollars were be being used in our view to violate the Fourth Amendment, but because the program was secret and we couldn't identify specific individuals, the Supreme Court dismissed the case because of standing. If a similar program existed here in New Hampshire, uh, we wouldn't be able to bring suit. Um, even though we know that there are injured, injured individuals um, in, as a result of the Duncan decision. So to me, that's kind of another example, a privacy example of how taxpayer standing would increase government accountability. This is really an issue about getting people's foot in the door to have legitimate questions resolved by the courts. Um, that's why we have courts. That's, that's their job, to decide hard questions. And with that, I'll conclude my testimony. Any questions from the committee? Thank you. Green? Oh, it's Donna Green? Donna. Yeah. It, is that right? Yeah. Yes. I, I was looking at David Green, but it's Donna. Oh, all right. Thank you. Um, I have two examples um, in my own uh, recent past. Um, I live in Sandown. And um, the uh, cooperative school district uh, wanted to close one of our two elementary schools. And uh, the, uh, the operating money for one of the elementary schools was removed from the budget. And there were two citizen uh, petition warrant articles put on the school district budget to reinstate the funding for the school. Both of those warrants failed. So, as a result of the election, there was no operating funding for the school, and the school was to be closed. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that was the will of the voters of the entire district, not necessarily our own town, but you know, that was the will of the voters. However, the superintendent decided to repurpose that school and keep it open, nevertheless, despite two warrant articles and the budget funding being removed. Um, and in addition to, um, uh, so this involves some consolidating of students to um, our other elementary school, which was all done through non-public meetings. And so our town, with a neighboring town, both in the school district, the cooperative school district, sued the school district for violating the right to know law because the uh, planning of the consolidation was done in non-public sessions. Um, and, um, or at least no minutes and without public notice and without opportunity for the public to attend. And they also sued on the grounds of budget law violations because no means no. There was no funding, so therefore the school should have been closed. So both Danville and Sandown sued the Timberlane School District on these two issues, and they lost on the grounds of standing at Superior Court. They asked for reconsideration, they lost on reconsideration, and they did not uh, pursue this to the Supreme Court. So that's one example. We're, we're not just talking about individuals here. We're talking about towns being able to enforce budget law in, their, in a, a cooperative school district. So towns themselves find themselves without standing to enforce laws. 
Um, in one of uh, my cases, um, I was a school board member, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and um, I wanted access to detailed information on how the school district um, uh, default budget was constructed. And um, Mr. Lehman very kindly represented me, and I'm proud to say I'm one of the few individuals in the entire universe who had standing to prosecute that case because I, as a school board member, I had to sign an oath to DRA saying that um, I, I affirm that the information in this default budget um, form that we're submitting to DRA is complete and accurate. And because I was denied information on how that budget was drawn up, I could not in good faith sign that. So that was my unique harm that gave me standing in that case. I hope that's correct. Um, I lost the case ultimately anyway because um, the judge interpreted the law as not to require uh, detailed information to be provided to me. But at least I did not lose that case on standing but almost anybody else would have. So there are a lot of people who are very upset with the way their school district or their town devises the default budget. I'm sure you know that. Often the default budgets are higher than the proposed budget. And this upsets a lot of people, but very few people have standing to take that to court. So that's why this, uh, this constitutional amendment is so very critical. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions from the committee? Thank you. And our final speaker, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I prepared a handout here for committee members. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, committee, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ray Chadwick. I'm chairman of Granite State Taxpayers. Uh, you've heard mention already of a variety of instances where uh, Taxpayer lawsuits would be appropriate, in fact, even one would say necessary. In my handout, I've given you an overview. I'll just hit some brief summary remarks here. Uh, your overview also includes the document that was co-authored by Mr. Bissonnette and our GST member and former New Hampshire Supreme Court member Chuck Douglas. And in that, they respond directly to the Duncan decision and refute some of the comments made by attorney Ben Loan. Every taxpayer has a vital interest in and a right to the preservation of an orderly and lawful government regardless of whether his purse is immediately touched. For 150 years, those words were the New Hampshire Supreme Court position regarding taxpayer standing and the ability of taxpayers to bring suit against the government. That came to an end in 2010 with the decision Bayer versus Department of Education where the court then eliminated taxpayer standing in such suits. The uh, legislature responded in 2012, amended RSA 491-22, reestablished standing, and of course then the court came back in 2014 with the Duncan decision and removed standing again. We support, Grand State Taxpayers supports this constitutional amendment, CACR 15. We supported the similar version CACR 5 in June of 2015. We support the ability of citizens to bring suit against irregularities they may find in government actions. Um, the Supreme Court has denied that in the Duncan decision, so the only remedy before us now is for the legislature to put this question to the voters to reestablish standing. So we urge the Rules Committee members and the full Senate to approve this CACR, put it before the voters. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Would it be your opinion then that in 2010, 2012, and 2014 that the courts expressed extreme humility? <laughs> extreme humility? Hubris might be a better word, I would think. But uh, don't take my word for it. Chuck Douglas and Mr. Bissonnette have made, rendered an opinion on that and you have it in your hands. Yeah. So I'll be happy to uh, defer to them for a legal analysis. <clears throat> Thank you, I was just based on Mr. Zibble's uh, statements of how that uh, yeah, was well, judicial community. I heard that, it was very interesting and I think a little <laughs> overwrought. I, I think the courts have the ability to prevent frivolous lawsuits 
already, and as I point out, for 150 years, they seem to have no problem with doing so. Are there any questions from the committee? You are my last speaker. Does anybody else wish to Excellent. speak? Oh, we have a we have a hand in the back, but thank you very oh, much. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Representative, I, I didn't see your name on the uh, on the speaking list, so I must have missed it. My name is on the list, but I chose I marked I would not want to speak. Okay. But it wasn't until so I do just for a minute. You have a right to change your mind. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, for the record, my name is uh, Representative Kurt Welper. I represent Stratford District 3, the towns of Stratford and New Durham. I was one of the 18 members of the judiciary and the 309 members of the House who supported CACR 1615. However, I have this to say, two things to say about that. One is this. I support this because the our part one article eight to which this is amended is about accountability of government and in the immediacy of governmental action the only accountability that can be had is to the courts to wait for two years or three years depending on whatever for an election to change our officers is to subject the citizens to illegal government activity with no recourse that's an atrocity. As Madison said, we have a right to our property and a property in our rights. And when our rights are being violated, as Representative Birch talked about earlier, when he said you had to have skin in the game, I would say my rights are the skin. Simple as that. And so I highly encourage you to pass this in one form or another, which brings me to my second point. On lines 13 through 15, of the proposed amendment. It says, however, this right shall not apply when the challenged governmental action is the subject of a judicial or administrative decision from which there is a right to appeal both statute or otherwise by the party proceeding. So I see those as two completely separate and distinct ideas. The first idea being, the up down through line 12, that the taxpayer has an inherent, essential, you've heard this before, natural right to hold the government, to coerce, if you will, the government to obey the law. And the second part is whether or not it actually applies to the person in some kind of judicial proceeding, which I don't believe needs to be in, in here at all because it doesn't have anything, in my view, to do with the constitutional right. It's strictly an administrative procedural right. So with that, I would suggest that those lines be removed. But I would support this in either case, as I have already. I just think it would be better. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, are there any questions from the committee? Just could you say again the lines that you would- 13 through 15. Beginning, the sentence beginning with, however this right shall not apply. Any further questions? Seeing that, thank you very much. Thank you. One once, anybody else want to talk? One twice. We close the hearing. And I wanted to reject this, but we're missing some of the gravity. Hang on one second. Let's see. Discussion about it? I mean, we have to be, let's go into executive this discussion. I'm in the exec session. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Seeing that. Senator Daniels, you, you're I, I just wanted to address the uh, the comment about lines 13 to 15 being removed and that they were removed. I, don't, I have no idea whether that would make a difference or what difference it would make to, to the rest of it. So, Is it substantial enough to, to remove or does it? Well, looking at the What's that? I think that the purpose of that sentence is to avoid a litigant, say, in an, you know, an administrative proceeding from opening up a second, sort of a second front in a war and going to court and, and alleging that the administrative agency or a municipality is acting outside of its statutory authority while they're still in the process of 
litigating whatever the underlying action is. Because presumably, you have a right, if, if an administrative agency is taking action, you have a right to argue to them that they're acting outside the scope of their authority. And if they say, no, we're not, you can appeal that to the Supreme Court. So I, I think it's to, uh, I think it's to make sure there's all the litigation is happening in one forum at one time. Senator Two O'Clock. Um, so my question is, in reading this, it doesn't ultimately prevent um, the public um, or individual taxpayer um, to petition the Superior Court. It's just a question of at what point in the proceedings if there's some other action already in place. Is that correct? I, correct, and I think uh, my, my sense of it is, I, I think that's right, and my sense of it is that this taxpayer standing provision creates a venue for a taxpayer to challenge government action, but not a defense to a government action against a person. So if the government has initiated an action against somebody, this doesn't come into play. If somebody is a taxpayer and sitting there and is saying, um, hey, what selecting what you're proposing to do is illegal, then that this, that's what this is supposed to um, ensure that taxpayers are able to do, to prevent, to prevent the government from acting illegally apart and aside from instances in which the government is directing its action at you individually. Follow up? Follow. So would your advice be that we keep that language? My advice is not an impediment I, I would, to the purpose of this, that it, it does provide clarifying Correct. Language. That's how I see it. <laughs> and for the discussion for now, we're going uh, to close the hearing in a sec. Do I have a motion to move out of the sec? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? None. And we are done for the day. Thank you.